Hello, I'm Gavin Giovanoni, Professor of Neurology at uh, Barts in the London. And I want to just share a little bit of information that we have acquired from looking at the data we collected as part of the original natalizumab or Tysabri phase three trial called the OFIRM study. In the study, natalizumab was compared to uh, placebo. And as you're aware, the drug got uh, licensed as a result of the study. For those of you who don't know, natalizumab is a monoclonal antibody. It's uh, and it targets uh, what we call an adhesion molecule. It's called VLA4, alpha 4, beta 1 integrin. Uh, and this actually is like the Velcro that allows um, white blood cells, particularly lymphocytes, to stick to the blood vessel and then pass through into the brain. And by coating the white blood cell, the lymphocyte, uh, with natalizumab, that can't stick, so the Velcro doesn't work, and therefore it stops the trafficking or the movement of lymphocytes into the central nervous system. Um, it also stops normal function, immune, what we call immune surveillance. So we need lymphocytes to go in there to look for infections, and that's probably the most important adverse event associated with natalizumab, is that if you do develop an infection on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, your immune system can't find it and fight it. And the main infection that emerged is from this virus called the JC virus, and stands for John Cunningham. That's the name of the first patient that got this infection. Uh, and this causes a condition called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. P for the progression is obvious. It, it's, once you have it, it gets worse. Multifocal because it affects different parts of the brain. And leukoencephalopathy, leuko meaning white matter, it affects mainly the white matter. Interestingly, it doesn't really affect the spinal cord. I don't know why. Um, uh, and that's been the main limitation of its use. Uh, not everybody is susceptible to PML. You have to have the virus in your body. The virus has to undergo a mutation. And obviously, the higher the, or the viral load or the levels of the virus, um, the greater the chance of acquiring this infection. The good news is that we now have strategies to de-risk people from getting this. Uh, people who don't have the virus don't get it. And by extending the dosing from four to six weeks of natalizumab, you also reduce the incidence quite markedly. And you can also look at the level of the antibody against the virus uh, as well. So the de-risking of natalizumab is at least allows us to use it relatively safely uh, in people with uh, multiple sclerosis who are virus negative. And even if they're virus positive, we can de-risk them by and, uh, using the index, the antibody index, and by extending the interval of dosing. Um, I think um, as a person working in MS for 25 years, I like to think of the knowledge base around MS as being what we knew prior to natalizumab, so I call it the pre-natalizumab era, and the post-natalizumab era, because natalizumab, I think, has taught us more than any other therapy or any other insight about the pathogenesis or what's driving a multiple sclerosis. And this is a poster that was presented at our recent uh, Virtual American Academy of Neurology meeting by Peter Calabresi. But a group of us, um, uh, with the help of Biogen statisticians, reinterrogated all the, the data from the trial. And we just simply asked the question, which variables that were collected in the trial? Because when you do a study, you will collect data across uh, the two years of the study, and you collect them in multiple time points. Then which variables actually predict the treatment response compared to placebo? Now, you could look at individual variables, but much more importantly, some variables are, are related to each other. For example, relapses, attacks, may be related to EDSS. So you actually have to put them all together and control for them, and we call this a multivariable, multivariate analysis. And when you actually look at which variables um, predict the treatment response, which is illustrated, it's the inflammatory variables uh, and not the degenerative variables that predict treatment response. So the first one was the uh, MRI metrics of inflammation. So that's new lesions. So we call them as white blobs or the expanding new lesions or the actual enhancing lesions when you give the contrast agent, gadolinium. So these are markers of new inflammatory lesions. The next one was another objective measure, which was neurofilament levels. And neurofilament levels are the proteins that release from damaged neurons and axons. When you break them up, they release their contents and you can measure the protein neurofilament in the peripheral blood in the serum and the level is equivalent to how much damage has occurred from these lesions. And the next one was relapses, whether somebody had or didn't have relapses uh, in the trial. So these are pretty obvious now, 
but these are what we call inflammatory markers. All the other markers contributed zero to the multivariate analysis in terms of predicting treatment response. So things like disability score, nylon peg test, you know, upper limb function, time 25 foot walk, lower limb function, brain volume loss, in other words, how much shrinkage of the brain that's occurring in the second half of the year, and then cognition using the paste or auditory based auditory serial addition test added nothing to predicting the treatment response. So again, this is telling us that Luzumab does what it says on the tin. It's anti-inflammatory. It stops inflammatory markers, but it doesn't do very much to those other functional markers that are probably dictated by other things. How much reserve you've got in your system, how much previous damage there's been, uh, other factors that are driving worsening, for example, comorbidities, things like obesity, lack of exercise, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, smoking, all those other things that nalizumab can't modify. Uh, and so I think we need to actually now reconsider our treatment targets. When you have an anti-inflammatory therapy that's purely anti-inflammatory, we should judge it on what it can and can't do. Nalizumab stops inflammation. That's what it does. It stops new lesions, it stops relapses, and it stops new damage and raise neurofilament levels. It can't necessarily modify those other factors, okay, which may have been primed by previous damage uh, or maybe getting worse by aging or other, because that's not natalizumab's role. And so this brings us to the next insight is natalizumab is the step one, switch off inflammation, and it's one of our best drugs at doing that. Then what do we do about those other factors? So this is why we need a sandwich. We need to add on neuroprotection, protect those damaged nerves from the past and try and keep them alive. Maybe we can remyelinate them if they need remyelination. And if they are damaged, can we restore function? You know, can we cause the surviving neurons to sprout axons and reconnect damaged pathways? That's what we call neurorestorative therapies. In addition to that, we need to target those other mechanisms that are uh, driving worsening of neurological function um, that are independent of MS mechanisms or inflammation, for example, the aging mechanisms uh, or lack of exercise and all those things. And this brings forward the, the concept of marginal gains. If we identify all the factors that cause neurological function or disability to get worse in people with multiple sclerosis and we improve all of them by a small amount, we'll have a big impact on the final outcome for MS. Um, so this is just uh, another insight, another learning experience uh, from natalizumab. And this reminds me of a lesson that Professor Mark Feldman, uh, may, may, most of you may not know him, uh, so he was one of the uh, uh, original thinkers around the anti-TNF-alpha therapies in rheumat rheumatoid arthritis. So him and Tiny Miney that pioneered the development of infliximab, the first monoclonal antibody that neutralized TNF-alpha, a important cytokine in driving RA damage. And he said to me, Gavin, whenever you put a new molecule or an experimental therapy into an individual with a disease like multiple sclerosis or a group of people, like the trial participants in the Affirm or Nalizumab study, you're doing a experiment, but you then need to maximize the knowledge you acquire from that experiment by collecting as much information and studying them as much as possible. And I think this is an example. I mean, this trial uh, you know, ran from uh, to, uh, 2002 to 2004, if I recall correctly, in that epoch. And we're now in 2020, and we're still learning lessons from the data from that trial. And that's a remarkable thing, is that uh, it's never too late to learn and have new insights. So um, I hope you uh, understand the concept and the important message from this. If your neurologist or your healthcare professional offers you an anti-inflammatory therapy and they're promising you things that go beyond inflammatory markers, don't accept that because anti-inflammatory therapies can only do what they're designed to do, stop inflammation. Obviously, if they're saying to you, this is an anti-inflammatory plus a neuroprotective drug, Okay, and then you'll say, well, what is the evidence for neuroprotection independent or over and above its anti-inflammatory effects? And that's the, the next stage we're going to get to. Are there therapies based on this kind of analysis, okay, this kind of analysis that uh, give us neuroprotection in addition to the anti-inflammatory effects? There are lots of claims. Uh, I'm not sure uh, any of our other disease-modifying therapies um, will actually improve the area under this curve. Um, over and above the, the, the effects on the inflammatory markers. 
the hints that some of them may have other modes of action, but I'd like to see this analysis now repeated for all our other treatments um, to see how that stacks up against uh, natalizumab. If you have any questions, please ask me either on the uh, YouTube channel or on the blog, uh, whatever, and I'll try and address them. Thank you.